Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Shabani, and on behalf of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Merit Sudkovich as our next speaker this morning. Dr. Sudkovich's research and clinical activities are dedicated to the study and treatment of people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Dr. Sudkovich is Chief of Neurology at Mass General, where she directs their ALS program, as well as Director of the Neurological Clinical Research Institute and the Julian Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. A 2009 recipient of the American Academy of Neurology Sheila S.A. ALS Award, Dr. Sudkovich is also co-founder and former co-chair of the Northeast ALS Consortium, as well as principal investigator of the Clinical Coordination Center for NINDS's Neurology Network of Excellence in Clinical Trials, otherwise known as NeuroNext. We are thrilled to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sudkovich. Hello, I'm Merit Sukovich. I'm very happy to be invited here and thank you to speak about some of the advances in therapy development for neurodegenerative disorders. And I'm gonna use ALS as a, a model of disease just to highlight some of the major uh, advances that are happening in our field. So ALS is, is not as uncommon as people think. Um, the incidence is one in 100,000 people per year. However, one in 300 men and one in 400 women will eventually uh, get ALS and die from ALS. And this number is increasing globally as the population ages, as this is an illness that gets more common as you age. While the incidence I mentioned, one in 100,000, um, is true in the, in, when people are in the 50s, by the time people are in their late 70s, it's 11 per 100,000. So in the U.S., there's 5,000 new diagnoses uh, each year, about 20,000 people living with it. This is an illness where people develop a weakness in their limbs or their muscles of uh, speech or breathing and typically have a lifespan of three years uh, or less. Most of the people with ALS have what we call sporadic disease, but there are about 10% of people where the illness runs in the family, and we know most of those genes, and we have learned a lot about the biology of both familial and sporadic ALS from those genetic studies. We do have four FDA-approved treatments for people with ALS. Uh, two of them are related uh, uh, drugs, Orilazole and Tikluktik. Tikluktik is a, another uh, way, another mode of administration for Orilazole. Deravone and Nudexta. Uh, the first three work out to slow down the illness. Nudexta is a symptomatic treatment. Yet, even with these um, treatments, uh, the illness still progresses and is still fatal. So there's a much need to develop uh, even more effective treatments. I mentioned the genetics of the illness. I want to just point out that uh, we know so much more now in 2020 about the biology of ALS, and that's given us targets to go after and is really the driving force why we have more than 160 companies in the ALS space developing treatments. We know from studying the familial form of the illness that the genes kind of, gene mutations uh, go into different categories. So there's many that affect protein quality control, many that affect cytoskeletal dynamics, and a whole bunch that affect RNA biology. And that leads to downstream uh, effects that result in protein aggregation, uh, oxidative stress, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, neuroinflammation, all themes that are also true in other forms of neurodegeneration. And what we see is that when we look at people with sporadic disease, they have the same biology as those with familial ALS. They're just getting to it from a different mechanism. And so many of our treatments are in development for both the familial and sporadic forms of this illness. And one can look at Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and have a similar uh, story where there's a small fraction who have a, a genetic form and a larger group sporadic and where you can learn um, by really developing models based on some of the genes. And many of the pathways here are overlapping with those neurodegenerative diseases, but clearly in different parts of the brain and central nervous system. This is a partial list of treatments in development for people with ALS, with the colors showing um, in blue uh, drugs that have had positive phase two trials. So not definitive phase three trials, but positive early phase trials. In red are ongoing phase three trials. So you see a lot of activity uh, therapeutically in ALS, and this has really uh, escalated the last couple of years as we understand the biology more. Um, 
I'll say that the AMLX, the AMX0035, was just reported as a positive uh, pivotal trial in NeuroN, also in red. Um, that's a stem cell treatment, and we're expecting those results uh, by the end of the year. And we've also seen the field move towards treatments just for the genetic form, so that are gene-modifying treatments, and I have some data to share on that as well. So we have this amazing uh, trial consortium throughout the North America called the Northeast ALS Consortium. It's over 137 centers, uh, really all over the uh, all over the United States, that work together on trials uh, and how to bring things to patients faster. And this group has developed the outcome measures, uh, the data resources, uh, uh, samples, and clinical data, all open source to really push the field forward. And so this group is now leading many of these trials, as well as a new platform trial in ALS. And similar to this group, there are uh, other consortium, like the Huntington Study Group or the Parkinson Study Group, that are having that same role in those diseases. And, and I'll just say that there's huge advantages to having those collaborative groups because they can share data, they can share resources, and they can really push the field forward much faster with creativity about how to, how to actually develop treatments for these awful illnesses. So, I want to highlight some of the changes that have happened in ALS to help us get to more positive drugs. And these approaches are also highly relevant and being used in other neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's, um, MSA, et cetera. So one is to try to um, enrich your cohort of, of participants in your trial so you're more likely to get success. And you can enrich uh, really based on two ways. One is using clinical features, and that is an approach that was used um, in the Adaravote study that led to its market approval and also used in the AMX0035 drug that was recently announced as positive and the neuron trial, which we're waiting the results of. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, but basically, the idea is to take people who are more similar to each other, fast-progressing uh, participants, so that in the six-month period, with a reasonable size cohort, um, yeah, you can get a clear answer. The other approach to cohort rich, of course, is based on biology. This is the preferred approach, but is often difficult because you need to have those tools to be able to um, pick people based on their biology. But we are moving that way in ALS, and I'll give you an example from the genetic forms, but there are also approaches in the sporadic forms. And lastly, given the, the huge pipeline, we really felt that it was time to take those initiatives already successful in oncology, where you're much more creative and adaptive in your trials and bring those approaches to the ALS field. And I'm happy to say we launched the first ever platform trial in ALS in July of 2020, and that's enrolling very well. And we're going to see more of these platform trial approaches in many neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so I'll, I'll show you what we're doing, but I, I think we're going to be seeing this a lot in our future in neurology. So an example of the first approach of, of enriching uh, your cohort by clinical features really came from a study in Japan with the drug called Radicava, which is now FDA approved in the U.S. as well. Um, and the idea here was to take people early in their illness who had widespread disease uh, and a fast progression. And that way, in a six-month period, one could see a result. And when they did this, they saw a 33% slowing of the illness on top of standard of care, which was Rilazol. And it was this trial that was considered pivotal and led to the approval. And so while this is a very good trial approach, what we don't know is whether this drug actually only works in fast progressing people or if this is really just a good trial design approach to get to an answer in six months. But it is approved for everybody with ALS and that came on the market a couple of years ago. Another company, um, Amalex, used a similar approach to test their uh, uh, combination treatment of phenobutrate and, and um, Tudka, also known as Terso. And the idea for this uh, drug uh, combination came from two young men uh, during their college years at Brown University, where they were looking for uh, repurposed drugs that might work on 
pathways for cell death important for Alzheimer's disease and ALS. And they came upon these two drugs. Uh, one of them, sodium phenylbutrate, works on ER stress and had been already shown in models of Huntington's disease and ALS to be neuroprotective. And the other was torosodial, uh, also shown in models of uh, Alzheimer's disease as well as uh, ALS to be protective and working works on mitochondrial dysfunction. And they did studies that show that adding these two drugs together uh, was more than synergistic in the models of cell death, uh, both in vitro and in vivo. And this led them to want to bring it forward to patients with ALS. And I was fortunate to meet them early on in this process and introduce them to our NEILS consortium and our science advisory board there to help them uh, design the trial and bring this forward for people with ALS. So uh, we fast forward and design designed a trial um, not that dissimilar to the uh, Darabone trial where we enriched clinically for people with a faster progressing course. And we did that by taking people less than 18 months from symptom onset, breathing more than 60%. And people could take standard of care. Uh, 137 people were randomized, two to one Amelix or the AMX035 or placebo and treated for 24 weeks. Dr. Paganoni, who works with me at the Healy Center for ALS at Mass General was the lead investigator. And we did show a success, and this was reported in, uh, recently in the New England Journal of Medicine article. And by success, uh, we saw a slowing of the decline of loss of function with this rating scale commonly used in the ALS uh, field called ALS functional rating scale. And so it lowered it um, by uh, about uh, 2.32 points when look, looking at slope or 2.92 when looking at a change. And for example, what does that mean for a person? That might mean that they're able to uh, walk up and down the stairs independently uh, and not have to hold on to a railing. Might mean they can feed themselves without assistance or uh, they might be able to um, sleep without the assistance of, uh, of a respiratory machine. So each one point is a big impact for patients with ALS. So this was a meaningful uh, finding. In that study, um, after the double bond period, everybody went on open label extension uh, for almost two to three years. And we were able to see the impact of early intervention versus starting it six months later. And that comparison showed a 44% um, prolongation of survival if you started this combination treatment six months earlier. And this study was just published in Muscle and Nerve. So this is very exciting for the field. This combination of treatments, uh, while this uh, is a study in ALS, they also launched a study in Alzheimer's disease and those results are expected by the end of the year. And that study is called Pegasus. So again, showing that a, there's overlap in some of the biology between these neurodegenerative diseases and we can learn from each other on the treatments we pick to bring forward as well as trial methodology. Uh, so this is now under discussion with the regulatory agencies about the next step, whether that would be uh, going to a, a new drug application and approval or requiring additional studies uh, pre-marketing. So now I want to switch to the other approach of, of cohort enrichment, which is based on biology. And again, this is what people are most excited about in the field of neurodegeneration, but it requires having the tools, whether that's imaging or fluid biomarkers or ways to pick out uh, cohorts that might have the biology your drug uh, targets. And the best example really is uh, looking at the um, amazing advances in gene therapy approaches for all neurogenic diseases. So we also reported this summer in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, article in July, the results of the phase one, two trial of an antisense oligonucleotide approach for um, SOD1 ALS. So SOD1 ALS is the um, uh, first gene that was ever found that to cause ALS and it's the second most common form of the genetic form of ALS. And it has uh, different rates of progression with the most common gene mutation having a super rapid course of less than one year. So we launched this uh, gene therapy uh, trial uh, with, uh, with Biogen and with centers all over the United States. Um, and again, this was a, a first a single dose and then a multi-dose safety study, but also looking at uh, pharmacodynamic markers and uh, preliminary looks at efficacy. So the main goal was safety and dose finding, looking at a measurement of the drug called tofersin in the plasma and CSF, looking at the change in the levels in the CSF of its target, which is SOD1 protein, and uh, also exploratory markers of change in clinical measures, as well as markers of axonal injury called neurofilament light chain or phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chain. And people, uh, were, uh, there were four dose groups 
um, with the highest one being 100 milligrams. And people were treated for 12 weeks in the double blind period and then open open label extension afterwards. So I'm going to show you the highlights of those results. I think this, again, is a really good example of a targeted treatment for a particular biological group. Um, the orange is the high dose group. And here we see that in a dose dependent manner, this drug to first and lowered the uh, protein SOD1. And again, this is what it's supposed to do and lowered it um, almost 40% at the highest dose, which is what our, our PK modeling in the animal studies had predicted. We also looked at exploratory clinical measures. I'm gonna show you two graphs for all this. One, using everybody. So you see it's a small study, but um, um, 10 people on the high dose of tofersin versus uh, 12 of the pooled placebo. Um, and also um, showing you also the uh, just using the people with the fast progressive mutations. And here orange is tofersin and blue is placebo. And you'll see that for all our outcome measures, people do better on treatment. Uh, but the, the difference is, is largest in the fast progression group where you see on the right here that the group that got to first in over 12 weeks basically did not change on this AOS functional rain scare, whereas the placebo group declined as expected, uh, you know, quite dramatically over that time period. Uh, same in the breathing measures, uh, SVC is slow vital capacity. We saw um, the group getting the drug declining less um, both in the entire group and the fast progressing group uh, compared to placebo. And same with a measure of strength called handheld dynamometry. Um, we saw uh, basically stability on the people on treatment and a decline in the people on placebo. Again, small study, uh, phase one, two, um, but uh, really uh, encouraging to go forward. And in fact, this study was amended to become a phase three and is actively enrolling people uh, throughout the world in the phase three trial right now. Lastly, I want to show its effect on a biomarker of neurodegeneration, which is uh, uh, used in ALS trials, but is also elevated in other neurodegenerative diseases such as MS and uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And here again, when we look at all everybody on the 100 milligram uh, dose versus the placebo group, we see about a 40% decline in this neurofilament level at 12 weeks. This is really significant. This is actually the first clinical study in ALS to show uh, an effect on this biomarker. Um, and also show a clinical effect at the same time. And this is the same um, plasma and CSF neurofilament, heavy and neurofilament light in the fast progression group, showing almost a 50% decline in neurofilament in the CSF uh, for people uh, with this fast progressing uh, form of ALS on the traversal. So this is now a move forward to phase three trials, actively enrolling, and hopefully we'll be finished enrolling soon. Uh, we did show good safety. We saw that it hit the target that lowered SOD1. Um, we showed uh, exploratory measures that there's a decline in the loss of uh, functional uh, abilities, respiratory and strength measures. We also saw a decline in neurofilament. So this is a really good example of a targeted gene therapy for a particular form of the illness. And as you know, we're seeing these types of trials in Huntington's disease. We saw huge success in spinal muscular atrophy. And there now are approaches to use the same technology, the same ASO technology, but to target uh, genes that might be important for um, even sporadic forms of this disease. And there's an ASO trial now that started also by Biogen um, attacking a taxon 2 that's open for all forms of ALS. So in my last couple of minutes, I just want to switch to a new initiative we've done, which uh, I think will be highly relevant for all forms of neurodegeneration, which is to bring platform trials to ALS. And this is an approach that's already been used in oncology to basically build one infrastructure test multiple drugs in that same infrastructure and keep going until you find the cures. And th there's huge advantages by building kind of your trial infrastructure once, lowers the cost, it cuts the time in half to get into effective treatments, and it greatly increases the chance for a participant to be on active trials. So the traditional way is one trial at a time, it takes a year to get your trial set up, you do your trial, and then if it's negative, you take down the whole machinery, and, and often you don't learn that much. Uh, this is a, to really revamp that. We don't want to do that anymore. And so we've started this trial and uh, with a lot of input, and we're testing three drugs to start with, but we're about to add a fourth. And if you're a participant, you get enrolled in this platform trial, and you're randomized to one of the available treatments, A, B, or C. You know which one you're in. 
let's say you're in regimen A. Then there's a second randomization where you're a randomized drug or placebo. And here we did a three to one randomization. So uh, 75% of people get active drug, 25% placebo. But the end of uh, 24 weeks, the comparison is one to one. You're pulling those placebo groups from all the regimens and comparing them to the active treatment group. So this is how you get the efficiencies um, cost-wise and time-wise and also much better for the patient. This is a much more patient-centered approach. And then when you add another regimen, you're just amending this protocol. You're not starting all over again. So instead of taking a year to get a, a trial off the ground, it can be a month. So it's super time efficient. So to get this going in ALS, we really tapped into the network we had already created through NEALS um, to get buy-in from the investigators. We had many meetings with industry partners with ALS drugs to get their buy-in from the beginning, and they were excited to be part of it. We talked to our patient advisory groups and got their input on the design, and we met uh, several times with the FDA, who was very supportive of this approach in ALS. So uh, we, we were supposed to launch last uh, April, but because of COVID, we had to delay um, a little bit, three months, to make it more uh, uh, COVID proof, as I call it, and have more things done in the home. Um, but we did start it early in July. So uh, I just wanted to tell you the drugs. So we started with the first three, and we made this a global competition to be part of this trial. And we had 30 companies apply to be part of it. And we picked actually five. And we started with the first three, a Zaluka plan by UCB Ra Pharma, a complement five inhibitor, for Dipistat by Biohaven, which is a myeloperoxidase inhibitor, CNM AU8 by Clean Nanomedicine, which is a drug that helps uh, catalyze the formation of NAD and other uh, other oxidative stress type pathways. And then uh, we're adding in December a Pridopidine, which is a Sigma-1 agonist from Polenia. Uh, and then in, in next year, we'll be adding um, IC-14 from Implicit. And we plan to keep adding two or three drugs a year and to keep going and adapting until we find the most effective treatments. So after 24 weeks, everybody has an open label option. That's very important in all our illnesses, but in particular in ALS, and that people can be on that until we know the results of the treatment. Uh, so we, this is really a partnership between the Healy Center at MGH, Niels, um, uh, Barrow Neurological Institute, all our, um, our sites, there's uh, 45 to 50 sites that are part of this and, and our company partners. Uh, we are also supported by a lot of different foundations uh, in philanthropy. But this was really launched by the major gift from a patient of mine to the Healy Center to get this off the ground. So we're, we're at a new place in ALS. Um, I'm very excited about everything we're doing from the targeted treatments to this platform trials. This approach really accelerates uh, how you develop treatment. When we added the fourth drug, it took nine days from uh, the IRB review to approval of that drug. And the FDA has a 30-day review of any new amendment, uh, new drug target regimen. That is significant time savings. Uh, and that's important because as our patients say, we need to be on the ALS clock, which means we need to be moving fast for them. There's strong support uh, for this approach. And uh, this is already starting in Alzheimer's. Um, and, and there's interest in the Parkinson's groups and the MS groups and stroke traumatic brain injury, we're going to see a lot of this in the neurosciences. It is a perpetual trial, and it keeps going until we find effective treatments. It took a village to pull all of this together, and I just, again, a shout out to our amazing scientific advisory committee at the Healy Center that helped pick the drugs, our uh, collaborative group throughout North America that works together on trials and meals, and the many, many foundations uh, that have given us support. Um, if anyone has a good idea for ALS treatments, they can apply on a rolling basis to be part of this, or if they want to learn about how to do this for your own disease, we're happy to talk to any group, because we certainly learned a lot from the oncology partners who helped uh, helped share their lessons with us when we're uh, developing this. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, we're at a new a point for therapeutics for neurology and neurodegenerative disorders where I think we're really going to be having uh, meaningful treatments uh, in the near future. Uh, thank you. <laughs>